Good evening everyone and yes Richard, welcome once again to Complain. Tonight I'm using the Celtic Daily Prayer, there's book two, I have book one as well. They are published by William Collins, they are from the Northumbria community and they're also available on northumbriacommunity.org. My reading is Colossians 1, 24 to 2, 7. And for anyone who's interested, I'm using the NRSV. Tonight, I'm using the Aidan Compline. Aidan came to Linda's farm from my owner in the year 635 at the request of King Oswald. He was a man of deep prayer who meditated on the words of scripture, equipping himself in quiet for an active and highly effective apostolate, he remained at Linda's Farm for 16 years. In 651, Aidan was taken ill at Bamborough and died. St Cuthbert, who was at that time looking after a flock of sheep on the Lammermuir Hills, saw a vision of angels taking Aidan's soul to heaven. O Christ, Son of the living God, may your holy angels guard our sleep. May they watch over us as we rest and hover around our beds. Let them reveal to us in our dreams visions of your glorious truth, O High Prince of the Universe, O High Priest of the Mysteries. May no dreams disturb our rest and no nightmares darken our dreams. May no fears or worries delay our willing, prompt response. May the virtue of our daily work hallow our nightly prayers. May our sleep be deep and soft so our work be fresh and hard. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Colossians 1, 24 to 2, 7. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. For I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face. I want their hearts to be encouraged and united in love, so that they may have all the riches of assured understanding, and have the knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am saying this so that no one may deceive you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, and I rejoice to see your morale and the firmness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Uh, my reflection comes from tritonubf.com. It's the Triton world mission center it is a little bit long so i'll probably end up trying to edit in my head as i go along paul began his letter to the colossian christians with thanksgiving and prayer for those precious christians who had been the fruit of a pharisee's preaching and teaching even though he'd not known these particular christians paul had always been very concerned about them 
at the time there had been many heresies regarding the person and works of our Lord Jesus. So Paul instructed them in some essential doctrine to help them remain rooted in the true gospel of our Lord Jesus. He taught them that he's the living God who came to earth to redeem them from sin and to reconcile them to God. After teaching them the supremacy of Christ, Paul reveals his shepherd heart for them in a remarkable way. Basically, he tells them how much he is suffering for their sake. He also illuminates them on the mystery of God. Read verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. To begin with, we are certain that there is nothing lacking in regard to the suffering of Christ. The suffering of our Lord Jesus in all its measure was enough to fulfil all the requirements of salvation. In other words, the suffering of Christ was complete, providing everything we need for redemption. The forgiveness of our sins and the rec rec our reconciliation with our Father God. And anyone who puts his or her faith in Jesus receives God's mercy. When Paul talks about the filling up in his flesh, what was lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions or suffering, he was not talking about a lapse in the efficacy of Jesus' suffering. He was talking about his own suffering and about the fact that Jesus, that Christian suffering did not end with Jesus, but that it goes on in Jesus' name for the sake of the church, Jesus' church and his bride. Verse 24 again. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. Regardless of how much he suffered, Paul regarded his suffering with joy. When he spoke these words to the Colossian Christians, his point was not to burden them about his suffering on their behalf, but to encourage them that he had loved them enough to suffer for them. Suffering for Christ and for Christ's cause and suffering for the church of our Lord and for those who would be in the church of our Lord is not a burden but a joy. God often calls his people to suffer. Consider what Paul tells the Philippian Christians at one point. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to suffer for him. This is indeed remarkable. People hate to suffer. They are afraid of suffering. They consider any suffering a misfortune or a lapse in God's blessing. I have to say I can relate to that. But according to Paul, suffering was a joy. I know it sounds difficult to comprehend or digest. Um, yeah. But the truth is the truth. How can the work of God be done in the world without suffering? It can't when most people avoid suffering as if it was a plague. But God's work throughout history has been done and it has been done through the sacrifice of others who were willing to suffer for the glory of God. Jesus came to suffer. He offered up his life on the cross for our sins. After Jesus came the apostles and the saints who did not shrink from suffering but joined the Lord Jesus in, in serving the gospel of life. And that meant they offered themselves as those who would gladly suffer for the love of God. We are born to this world, so we must be born hating to suffer. But when we are born again in Christ, we must be given to whatever it takes to bring the gospel to a dying world. And that includes suffering. Read verses 25 to 27. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you. The word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. So then God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul never fails to remind us that he became a servant of God by God's commission. In other words, he was personally called by God. Paul felt a sense of honour to have been called by God in such a personal way. At the same time, this also reminded him of who he was before he was called and commissioned by God. He had been a great sinner and an enemy of God and his gospel. Before God interve intervened in his life, Paul persecuted the church of the Lord Jesus. He did atrocities in the name of, God, of a God he did not know. If God were to truly give him what he deserved, Paul knew in his deepest heart that he deserved not only to, to death but eternal condemnation. But God did not give him what he deserved. Rather, God showed him mercy and appeared to him while he was on one of his campaigns to destroy Christians. God forgave all his sins in Jesus Christ and he called him to serve the very gospel and the Lord he had formerly persecuted. Paul never forgot such grace in his life. He would have been commissioned by the enemies of the gospel to persecute Christians to death. 
Now he was a new man commissioned by God to preach the gospel to all people. He had a new purpose and new mission. Read those verses again. I have become its servant by the commission God gave to me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In this passage, Paul mentions the mystery several times. He tells the Colossian Christians that he's been commissioned by God to teach them the word of God particularly the mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations, but has been disclosed at last. What then is this mystery that was once hidden but now revealed? Read verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is this. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What does it mean, Christ in you, the hope of glory? It means that only Christ is the sure hope any man or woman has for attaining glory. Once all human beings were under curse, living in the power of sin. As such, no one could attain to the glory of God. For we'd all been short of that glory. But when Christ came, gave his life for the sins of the world. And when a man or woman confessed Christ as Lord, Christ begins to live in that heart. And that heart rises to glory. What does it mean, Christ in you, the hope of glory? It means we have no hope if Christ is not in us. People may think that there is hope in the world, but there isn't. As long as man must someday die, living behind all that she or he has gathered up in this world, there is no hope. There is no hope for man as long as man lives and dies in his sins. Our sins rob us of all hope in this world. Our sins also rob us of any hope we have in salvation. People depend on a loving God to save all humanity regardless of what they had done. But they do not know the righteous requirements of God. They do not know that unless the sin problem is solved or dealt with, no one can ever hope to be saved from eternal condemnation. Men and women need hope. They need to hope in God and in attaining what they would eventually want which is to rise above their own flesh and its desires and stand as glorious beings in the presence of God. But we have no hope or certainly no hope of glory if Christ is not in us. This is our only hope of glory that Christ is or be in us. Jesus came for this purpose. He suffered for this purpose that we might not die for our sins without hope and gl without glory. Jesus died for this purpose that he himself might become for us our hope, our hope of glory. Christ Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead in order to redeem our sinful souls and to reconcile us to God when we were irreconcilable. He sacrificed himself in order to bring to us the glory we lost long ago in the Garden of Eden and a glory we in ourselves do not have because of our sins. Because of our sins we live in a base world, a world that is fallen. Although I have to say I do think it does have glimpses. This pandemic may have shown the worst things but it, I think it's also shown quite a lot of good as well most people in the world glory in what they conquer in money or in other people or satisfying their sinful desires they glory in what they drive and in what they wear and what they eat Ooh, wearing clothes oh dear but that is no glory. It's mostly the shame of humanity to glory in such things, to glory in the debased and shameful in the ordinary and exotic, to glory in the thrills that fill people's lives with supposed meaning when all they do is practically meaningless. This is not the glory that God had intended for his children when he created us. <coughs> when he created us, he intended that we be like him, following his example, loving what is good and serving what is right and holy. A man or woman were intended by God to rise above their physical life, to embrace the higher noble things in life, to explore the spiritual world and to work, walk with God in high glory, not as equals, but as precious children who love God and honour him as God. When Jesus came to this world to set things right, he intended to restore that glory to man, but to do so, he had to sacrifice himself. And that's what he did. He sacrificed himself on the cross to deliver us from the shame and guilt of sin. And he promised us that when we put our faith in him, he will come and live in us and make his home with us. 
Jesus sacrificed all things in order to restore to us the hope that we truly need, the hope that we can once again live lives pleasing to God, doing what God intended us to do, serving his purpose, and that when we die we will not perish, but to have the hope of heaven burning in our hearts. When Jesus promised us this hope, it was not only a promise, it was a reality. When Christ lives in us, we have hope. We are changed from those who live a hopeless life in a hopeless world to those whose life is full of glory and hope. Truly, the only glory worth is having having is Christ in us. Paul deeply knew this truth. He was a man who murdered innocent people in the name of God. What he did was not only cruel, but inhuman and shameful. He was not destined for glory as he had thought, but destined to face God's judgment. But when Christ saved him and began to live in his heart, Paul changed into a man of love and sacrifice. His glory was no longer in the shameful things he did in his life. But his glory was in Christ Jesus, who loved him and blessed him. He said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I give, I live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What glorious words are these? They are the words of a man who had seen and tasted the only true hope any man or woman could ever have. Christ in him, the hope of glory. When we live the Christian life and labour for Christ and his church, we cannot do so with our own strength, but we must struggle with God's strength working in our hearts until the gospel is formed in his people's lives and until their only hope is Christ in them. A Christian is one who points at Christ and says, I can't prove a thing, but there's something about his eyes and his voice. There's something about the way he carries his head, his hands, the way he carries his cross, the way he carries me. My dear ones, O oh God, bless thou and keep in every place where they are. Into your hands I commit my spirit. I give it to you with all the love of my heart. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. I make the cross of Christ upon my breast over the tablet of my hard heart and I beseech the living God of the universe. May the light of lights come to my dark heart from thy place. May the spirit's wisdom come to my heart's table from my saviour. Christ without sin, Christ of wounds, I am placing my soul and my body under thy guarding tonight. Christ of the poor, Christ of tears, thy cross be my shielding this night. O thou son of tears, of the wounds of the piercing, I am going now into the sleep, O be it in thy dear arm, arms keep, O God of grace, that I shall awake. My Christ, my Christ, my shield, my encircler, circular each day, each night, each light, each dark. My Christ, my Christ, my shield, my encircler. Each day, each night, each light, each dark. Be near me, uphold me, my treasure, my triumph. Circle me, Lord, keep protection near and danger afar. Circle me, Lord, keep light near and darkness afar. Circle me, Lord, keep peace within 
keep evil out. This peace of all peace be mine this night. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. While the idea of suffering as Christ did is an important one, I think it's also important to know that Christ did love us. He wanted us to live a better life than the one we could have done without him. And that's why ultimately I don't think it matters whether people are with God at a particular moment or not. I do believe in my actions more than my words very often. And so I, I trust in my actions that they will express my faith and my belief in God. Rather than necessarily putting the gospel down people's throats, although I have found that I've not been shoving it down people's throats, but I found it increasingly quite interesting as I've done these videos. It's important to live as Jesus would want, to live as him in kindness and compassion and consideration of those who do not have as much as we do. And with all God's blessings and love, I wish you a peaceful night and a good rest. Amen. God bless you.